those events, or at least what I got is, we continue to be a school district that continues to fight above our weight class. We punch up, not down, and it's really a tribute to the educators and the supportive parents in this town. I mean, at 10.30 at night when the bus pulled in with the kids who had been rehearsing for Drama Fest and had been going into Boston, kids are so wiped out, they're almost erased, and the teachers who are going with them are as well. And you think about the effort they put in year round. It's really a testimony to their professional dedication and how lucky we are to have some of the people that we have up at the school leading those efforts. And I mean, I, I think the one of the standouts in that week was there's a, um, <clears throat> a kind of quirky student that I know who probably has been in my living room a hundred times and he was called upon to come out and do a solo as a part of this orchestral piece. And for a lot of his life, he's been in the shadow of his phenomenally taught, talented musical sister who went on to the Boston Conservatory. And he really blew the roof off the joint. And it was the, the funniest part was in the middle of this piece, while there's a pause for him and the orchestra is continuing, he reached down and snagged a water jug and took a slug from it as if he were on a soccer field. I've never seen that at Symphony Hall. But he was phenomenal. And again, just a testimony to the effort that's been put into that program, the talent of our kids, and the fact that this school really has a lot to be proud of in terms of both the performing arts and also the academics and the athletics, because we also have a lot to celebrate there. So I just wanted to share that because for me, that was kind of a, a, a blowout week of varieties of student achievement at all sorts of age levels, at all sorts of venues, and it, it really just, I don't know, it just really impresses you that a town with this small a system can be, can be competing with school districts like Peabody and Maskinomet. Really a testimony to the effort that people put in. Oh, oh go ahead. I was just going to say that in addition to the staff, the amazing staff that are doing all these programs and the families, um, I was at the middle school chamber concert last night, which is held at the Shallon Lou. Um, and the drama llamas going to Boston was in large part funded by the Education Foundation. So it just was striking me last night while I was, you know, at that beautiful concert hall, how lucky we are to have all these community partners that help to support what's going on in the schools um, by either, you know, last minute you need thousands of dollars to go to Drama Fest um, or just having these beautiful venues and having people there to help with the sound and with the lights and all of those things is just, I mean, it's such an amazing opportunity. I'm not sure if the middle schoolers quite realize yet <laughs> how amazing it is that they get to perform in that venue, but it's, it's really wonderful and it makes you feel really good to be that supported by the community. Well, and June has said this multiple times, you know, public schools, we don't often budget for success, which is a strange phrase. Um, but we, when we suddenly have programs that get to at the state level, um, maybe maybe here we should start budgeting for success, I guess, is what I'm quickly learning. Um, but, but we don't often do it that way. So, you know, we, you're, you're right. Thank you very much to the, to the partners and the, and the community who step up um, and make sure our kids can get to where they get and they get the funding they need. Um, outside of the outside of the, the budget, so it's it, it was a it's been a whirlwind couple of weeks. So, um, and there's yes. there's more coming up. <laughs> okay, so I guess that would move us on to subcommittee updates. And I'm not sure that we have. Um, the middle school council met, so I can give you a brief update Excellent. on that. Um, I think it was our last meeting of the year, actually, but we talked a little bit about the superintendent's entry plan. We went through through that with the with the council. Um, talked a little bit about transitions. You know, we're towards the end of the year, speaking towards those, thinking about the fifth graders coming up to sixth grade, and then the eighth graders going to high school. Um, and then the other thing that was really nice to, you know, which kind of follows a, exactly what you were talking about. Um, Principal Rodman is, I believe, he's the director of NELPS, the New England League of Middle Schools, which just held their conference um, a couple weeks ago. And we had several teachers from the middle school go to the conference, but also several teachers present at the conference. I think three, three teachers or so, um, which was really nice to see. So again, it's that professionalism and sharing ideas. It's really good. 
That's great. Other subcommittee reports? Probably not. Okay. Um, unfinished business. I don't believe we have any of that. Which not brings on the agenda. Us, not on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> um, new business. So I think we can move to the addressing hate in school sports because Jesse. So I do think we have at least one guest who's willing to fill in short term. Do you want to fill in quickly? Okay. So, um, so right. So Jesse Palm was uh, supposed to visit with us today. Yes, please. Um, but instead, maybe we have uh, Mary Beth Murphy fill in, and I know Dr. Dr. Ray Cahill is with us as well. Um, and so maybe you can fill in and give us a little bit of a commercial for what we were going to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let me get the email. Okay. So you guys probably all know that the Board of Health um, is now working with uh, Jesse Palm, who's a regional social worker. Have you heard about this? Thank you. Um, so we're sort of sharing her with um, Hamilton and Essex. Can you hear me better like that? I feel like I'm buzzing. Um, which I think is awesome because it's sort of tying together a lot of things like helping in our community. You know, she's going to be helping us with um, the opioid settlement funds. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, so um, uh, the Board of Health was sort of tasked with sort of trying to help the town figure out how to spend these funds. Do you remember how much they were, Ray? It's going to be, um, I think the town's going to be getting the equivalent of about just a hair over 10000 a year for the next 10 years, I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Jesse's been meeting with the guidance counselors, I believe, at all three schools. And she did have four points. And again, I, I mean, I could look at her. I could look at her slides and try to figure out what she wanted, but I can just sort of share also the email that she, she sort of gave to me. Um, and just let you know the four areas that she identified with the guidance counselors in the school that she would be requesting funds from um, the town um, f for uh, to be used in the school. And that's with, um, the first one is for transportation, because I guess there's a need for students to access um, mental health services uh, who don't have rides, basically. So that was one of the first things that she wanted to try to ask the town for. Um, vaping in school was the second issue um, and additional support for training around mental health and substance related issues um, so that was sort of where she she worked with your guidance counselors to see where she was going to be fitting in um, yeah with the school this is this is sort of all some of the other things not related to the school that she's doing um, the visiting mothers yeah um, so that's it. I mean, I don't know that the, the board of the school committee necessarily needed to vote on anything. I know in order for her to access the funds, it's basically going to be approved through the selectmen. So it'll be, you know, just, we were supposed to have our, our joint meeting on Tuesday, but that got canceled because of conflict. So I think it's pushed to next month. Um, so once that happens, she'll have the funds released to her and then she can use them for those things. So I do know that they're going to continue to work with the counseling department, um, school psychologists, social workers, that that kind of wellness, health and wellness team from the schools um, to really kind of come up with this first blush, which I think those are the four points I've heard about as well, mm -hmm. um, and just decide, like, can we prioritize them um, with and for her and with her so that when it gets to the Board of Selectmen, there's some kind of clear pathway. So I think they're trying to dig in on how, how much is real for the transportation versus how much around the vaping. The vaping really um, is a massive push. We need to do some education around it. It's not about just, you know, eradicating it, so to speak. I feel like we're back in, you know, the 80s when high schools had smoking lounges and we had to go through all of the anti-smoking stuff. It just feels like it's cyclical, and here we are talking about another version um, so, from our perspective, it's really around education and, and that kind of that kind of methodology, particularly around vaping. Do you know? I don't know if you know, Mark, or if you know, will the money for training um, is that exclusively for staff? Could it also be for parents and families? I don't think I don't think there's any rules right. attached. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. She can ask for whatever she wants through the for the selectmen, and they just have to would have to approve it. So it could be both. In, or both. in a perfect world, we're doing a wraparound, right? We're doing either either combined 
PD, so to speak, or we hold uh, school day PD and then evening events for, for families and, and, and guardians. Um, that's With this kind of work, that's really the only impactful way I think we get anything accomplished is if we get the families involved and let them understand where the concerns are and how they can help us help their families as well. So, yeah, I would, I would be pushing for some kind of wraparound. Uh, related to wraparound, so is the town getting money separately or just this money that comes to the school? Because it's all town money. It's all town money, and it's all the money that's coming to the school. Not, it's not all okay. going to go to the school. Yes, yeah. some of it. Will because go to the I think talking about wraparounds, sometimes the trauma that causes the need or the addiction that causes the need in the kids is actually happening in the home. Exactly. And I think in the past, there's always that concern that the school can't do it all. So some of it has to be doing happening at home. So yeah, that's great. we could try to pull up. Um, do we have the the? I think there were like. The, the email that we got about all the things that we were thinking of. Do you have that? Are you interested to know what else we were we were wanting to fund? Uh, I am partly because I do think the community often thinks the school should have to solve all the problems, and so yeah. I'm curious to hear how the town yeah. is also going to help the families. You, before you even do that, maybe can you just even talk a little bit? Because I think maybe I saw one of the slides that we went through, just about like who they are and yep. and like what is their mission. I guess if you know. And the other thing I was wondering, are there other funds that the, the Health Coalition has to bring towards Rockport? So some of that, those, those four items you were mentioning, is, is that only going to happen with funds from the opioid? Or can that still happen even if sh there's not as many funds given? Okay, so I can only say that my understanding is that um, there's the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which I believe you guys did in Rockport. I don't, is this the second yes. or third year that you guys did it? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but I know that that survey, it sometimes will free up funds. You can apply for grants once you do that survey. So who gets those funds and how it happens, I'm not quite sure. She would, Jesse would probably know better than me. But just the mere fact that we're doing the survey would set the schools up for other things. Um, and that's, you know more in the future so um do you want to tell them more i mean ray probably knows more about the coalition no for well i'm trying to find that email sorry yeah My i mean the, the, the public health, health coalition i mean we, they were the ones that helped us do the the vaccine clinics um so they they have sort of a wide reach they're doing like new mother they you know they're going now post pandemic if uh, um to new mother's houses to like give them a wellness check and so they're sort of doing a, um, a broad reach. Um, so. And what was the other question you had? Oh, other, other, other things. Yeah, so funding something called One Stop. You heard about this? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so in Gloucester has um, that, go, that going strong. So we're going to sort of be partnering with them and, and providing, you know, they, th they thought about maybe having like needle needle um, deposits, needle exchanges in town. Um, trying to think of what else. For one stop in particular? Yeah. Yeah, just, you know, helping individuals just literally just getting to tomorrow, just getting to the next day um, and making good decisions today. And tomorrow's a whole new chance to, yeah. you know, rinse and repeat and, and just make it to the following day, yeah. So that's what they're geared toward. You know, I think what is really important to talk about when we talk about emotional health is, you know, there's there's a negative stigma still around, you know, mental health in general sometimes, mm -hmm. even though I think we're becoming uh, more enlightened, so to speak, as a society around those needs. But just like we've gotten better at diagnosing cancer over time, we, have, we are much better at, di at di diagnosing mental health concerns as well. Mm -hmm. So when we start to say, well, we see more young people diagnosed earlier with anxiety or depression or some variant of mental health, um, it's not that the, I'd like to believe it's not that the world is just crumbling in on everybody, it's just that we actually have a better understanding of how to diagnose the needs. Um, and so, you know, the schools benefit from partnerships like this. We're going to continue to chase grant money like we always have from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed and from the state level um, and put as many of those into um, health and wellness um, needs as, as much as academics because um, all the data says if the kids aren't 
feeling a sense of belonging, aren't feeling a sense of mental health and security at school, it doesn't matter how great your curriculum is. We know that. We should have known that 50 years ago. Um, but, you know, the time is right now to, to address it. And, and I, I think, think post-pandemic is so, you know, yeah. it's sort of like it bubbled up. And so having these funds available now is, like, really very timely. Um, I think it would be great, too, to get some clarity around, like Mary Beth said, the, the YRBS and what kind of funds that opens up for us because it really wasn't clear. And that was part of the reason why we had such a hard time getting it off the ground in Rockport, I think, because the benefit was not clear and we never really I don't know if the person who was doing it back then resigned or is gone or yeah, something she's gone, I but think. Um, <laughs> we never really got clarity around what sorts of grants or anything like that we could get so that would be great and I can follow back with uh, Jesse and ask her about that right. specifically and could I, I'll just connect with you about when she's going to be at your next meeting I'd like to yeah our ne next meeting is next Monday and she should be there okay yeah but so I'll ask her make it I have one more maybe this is just something for Jesse but um, transportation costs that's fantastic mm -hmm. but I think that even finding uh, some some no someone to even talk to there's a lot of telemedicine now um, and so that's an option but yep. kids can't even find counselors mm -hmm. so if there's any way I don't know that money throwing money at it might not help at all but if there's any way she can help connect families to counseling would be great and, and you know Colleen we um, at our last Board of Health meeting we, we spent specific time talking about student access at the schools because as you alluded to you know some of these problems the trauma starts at home leads to some of these issues um, so home's not safe for a lot of these kids and so they will um, for them to have resources at the school someone to just listen and you know um, so to ha a have somebody available in a time slot that's available um, where what they say there stays there, um, independent of you know not even bringing the family into it yet. So those resources, a the people, how do they get trained? How do they get funded to be there for these kids? Um, is uh, is key. So that was something in particular that was probably one of the first things when we talked about the students and where can funds go? How do we how do we move the, use those funds potentially to to get that those point people in the school system? And any time, so I'm the liaison for the board of health from the school committee. So just any time that you know, sort of those discussions are coming up, I'd be, I'd love to have a heads up and attend the meeting, yeah. um, too. So anything I can contribute to that, or like bring back to the school committee, or yeah. um, bring back to the superintendent, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, if we want, if you want to have it as a line item someday. Um, I don't know. Our agenda is already set for their next meeting. Oh, yeah. And not that you need to put it on, but if you're going to be talking about students in a meeting, no. I'd love to okay. have the, be there. Yeah. For no, sure. I think I think Jesse's going to be really good for sort of closing the loop. I feel like there's always been, like, we will communicate between the, you know, the Board of Health and the school committee, but there's always, like, okay, well, also people at the school, like, that she's sort of, like, closing a circle that I think has been missing for a while. So I, I hope it I hope it works well. I think she's a she's a really great resource. She's nice too. And she's nice. How did you find her? Thanks for whoever found her. But how did you find her? That's great. Well, how did we find her? Um, she sort of was part of again during the pandemic. We sort of got hooked into all these sort of more regional. I mean, we had never done it in the past that I knew of. But once we started doing all these vaccine clinics, and we got hooked up with. Um, Who's the nurse? It's Rachel Lee. Rachel Lee. Yeah, she sort of brought in all these resources, and so they sort of worked together, and that's how we sort of... Rachel Lee's done a lot to sort of regionalize things, and there's been a big push in that with, in public health. Post-pandemic is one of the few things, positive things, I think, that has, have happened uh, because of the pandemic. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work going on sort of trying to, you know, get everybody on the same page. All these little local boards of health that we're all, in the past, we're all working sort of independently, you know. Sid Wedmore decided what we were doing, and that's what we did, you know. And now it's like this big, this big machine, so it's kind of cool. Yeah, and Rachel, Rachel and Jess, they, they've seen a lot that's been successful. Hamilton, Wenham, um, yeah. and so bringing that to our board meetings and saying, can we echo this or start the discussion here? So because they, you know, they just want to keep the momentum going from town to town. So they've been great. Yeah. Yeah, sorry she couldn't be here tonight. And maybe she had some sort of emergency, but, you know, I left a message for her, so. I'm glad you mentioned vaping. <laughs> because although <laughs> because you want to go vape? 
<laughs> no, no, because although it's a lot less visible with the elimination of the fruit flavors, one of the questions the middle schoolers asked during civics day mm -hmm. was what sort of educational efforts are there available to talk to students about this? So I'm not sure if that indicates that there is a personal need in that child's life, but certainly there is an awareness of it and a concern. So that, that's really good to hear because it kind of syncs with what our students are saying as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And we were at our last Board of Health meeting, sadly, both both stores, there's only two in town that sell nicotine products, failed their test where they came in and they both sold to underage. So oh they're both sort of on high warning. Um, so that happened. That's unfortunate. It's unfortunate, but it's in good in a way that it's like now we're in a new heightened awareness um, for kids not to be getting... You know, or not to be so able to get them in town. Although they could probably get them online, yeah, yeah. Amazon. So there's that. But um, well, yeah. you've probably all seen this. So my my two boys, twin boys, just they're in college first year, um, and we saw this with some of their friends in senior year, where they uh, some of their friends were vaping and no longer wanted to be, but it, they were struggling so hard at the age of 18 to try to kick this. And so they're like, oh, like, and so friends putting pressure on them, like, you can do this, come on. So um, you got to imagine what other resources are available when a kid wants to quit, but is just, mm. they, there's right. a chemical dependency, you know? Yeah. Or at least they had the support of their friends for kids who are kind of doing this in secret. It must be hard to... Sure. And I think, too, I had a conversation with Mary Ryan when Colleen was in school, and she saw a, a diminished lung capacity of kids. Wow. She notices, noticed that, you know, coming through back then, 2020, 2019. So it's, you know, even our student athletes, you know, you can tell. Um, you know, the, I think it's like a vitamin E that sort of set... Uh, Irritating the lining. Yeah, the lungs, yeah. It sort of settles in the lung, and it's, you know, who knows how long it lasts for, and what these kids' lungs are going to look like in 20 years. It's kind of scary. Yeah. And the sad thing is, it was vaping. I mean, it was always like the the healthy smoking, right? We all right. were told 10 years ago or 5 years ago, that, oh, vaping is better. It's just water vapor, you know, and then, you know, makes you wonder. All right. At 400 degrees with... <laughs> yeah, right? What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you both for your ad hoc presentation. <laughs> we'll be grading you later. <laughs> yes, I know. Well, you're going on to something even closer to my heart, which is uh, hate exactly. and sports. Mm -hmm. I feel like I could write a book. Mm. And I can tell you that, well, Ray and I both, you know, have sporty kids. And I can tell you that from the time Michael is kindergarten to now, thank God he's graduating... Wow, what a change in what's happening in sports. Yeah. Scary, and that's, don't know the topic. don't know the answer, but I can. I'm going to sit here and listen because um, it's you've it's, lived it. <laughs> I have lived it, yeah. and not only one sport, not only one parent, not only one kid, but it and it's and not only just Rockport. It's throughout every. It's crazy what is happening on sports fields and the hockey rinks is just mind blowing to me right now. It's not fun. So, anyways. Well, there's your segue. Right? It's a good commercial. I appreciate that. Go slide here. Cue us up here. So, in your um, drive, you have a couple supplementary resources. Um, Governor Healy, when she was, uh, before she transitioned to governor, um, one of her big uh, pushes out of the, uh, her, her previous office was to really um, attack this problem of, of hate in school sports head on. Um, and she forged a partnership with Bob Baldwin at the MIAA, um, who was also, he's a retired superintendent, very, very uh, well respected. Uh, educator in Massachusetts. Um, uh, some of us think uh, maybe a little crazy for taking over at the MIA, but um, we need good people um, leading leading some of these organizations. So uh, Governor Healy and and Bob worked together to really um, partner to figure out how we can get kind of like a statewide leadership think tank around this particular topic. Um, 
it's starting. The catalyst is sports, but I'll, I'll, at the end of this conversation today, you're going to see that in Rockport and in a lot of a lot of uh, my peers' districts, we're talking about taking this well beyond sports. We just see it in society, and we feel like if we don't address this with young student leaders now, um, many of us are fearful for the next generation of leaders in our country and in our world. Quite honestly, um, so the catalyst is sports. Um, and that's, as you said earlier, that's where the problem is right now. Um, but we see it quickly bleeding into other aspects of school life and potentially communities. Um, so Northeastern University has what's called the Center for the Study of Sports and Society. Unbelievable uh, organization. They partnered with the MIAA to put this together. Um, and originally on December 8th, um, superintendents from all across the Commonwealth, superintendents, their high school principal, and their athletic director, and that was the charge um, if your district was going to participate, the three of you went hand in hand um, as a leadership team to really learn about um, the issues at hand so we can kind of think tank it uh, in a broad-based way um, and then we could move on with some deeper training and, and what we could bring back to our districts to address some of these concerns. Um, so the kickoff was that full day um, at the garden, which was, was pretty cool environment right there in the garden. We split into um, lots of different groups and had sessions all day long, led by the professionals from Northeastern. And then we moved on and we participated in regional trainings. And so those regional trainings really focused around empowering school and athletic leaders. I don't want to read this whole thing to you, but it's up on the deck for you um, to help us develop our skills and tools um, to build safe spaces in our communities. Um, really, the concept here was to help us understand how unconscious bias, toxic speech, and all of those microaggressions that are happening in society are really um, intersecting and coming out as uh, incidents of violence um, and how can we eradicate that and identify it and er eradicate it originally through sports. Um, so that was primarily the focus, but the workshops were so, so powerful um, and that Amy and John and I kind of walked out of these workshops feeling like we needed more. Um, so we went to a two-day training on the 17th and the 18th um, at Endicott College. The facilitators were Jeff Lopes and Caroline Desir, um, both really, really high-quality presenters and facilitators. Um, Caroline does a ton of work in, in uh, greater Boston area with youth organizations. Uh, Jeff is uh, on the Boston Police Department, a uh, high-ranking officer. He's also the president of the BIPOC. I'm going to get it wrong, but I believe it's the BIPOC state um, police uh, organization. Um, he's also an adjunct faculty in one of the universities in Boston. So we had some really high credentialed uh, trainers for this particular um, workshop. And so we walked out of there um, really looking for more. And so I emailed Dan Leibowitz, who's the executive director of the organization, and Amy Rose and I did a uh, phone call um, just, uh, just over about a week ago. Um, to discuss how Rockport Public Schools can continue this work and partner with the center. Um, and he was really gracious with his time, spent about an hour and a half on the phone with the two of us. Uh, we talked about all of the professional development we've done in the district already um, in our first year together as a leadership team, talking about a sense of belonging and trying to frame um, our theory of action around, uh, around framing this work. Um, and we felt like we needed to dig in and do more of this training with the entire faculty, and then we wanted that to trickle down to student leaders as well. Um, so we scheduled, after our conference, we scheduled a full-day professional development with these exact two trainers starting at Rockport High School. Um, I feel like I've said this before, a lot of times you start with the younger students and you build up, but there is a couple times already I feel like I've said this to you where I feel like we have to start at the top. Um, and this is one of those places where I think if we can do the work at the high school and really hit our kids who are about to leave us with some really good knowledge and skills, they'll go off into the world in a better way. And then we can try to trickle that down in the next couple of years with the partnership with this organization. So they're going to come in in October. That's our full PD day based on next year's calendar. And they're going to do a full PD day with our faculty. They're also going to run student leadership trainings on separate days for the entire sophomore class. Um, we're targeting the sophomores after a long conversation with uh, Mr. Leibowitz because um, we all believe that if we pick that grade in the middle, it'll get some legs, and then they become your junior leaders and your senior leaders, and we can almost do a train the trainer with our students moving forward, and then we can just bring the organization in to do little checkups, and then we can bring it down to the middle school the following year. Um, so this will involve 
our student athletes, our, our, our leaders in all of these organizations, uh, student government, uh, fine and performing arts. Um, but right now we're talking about a full dose for every single sophomore and then maybe trickling that out to specific smaller groups of kids, all of our student captains um, and leaders in the other organizations. Um, the kids know it. The kids feel it. The kids see it. Um, a lot of the workshop, particularly the first day, was around... I'm going to be delicate with my word choice, was around how families present in public and how we, and I say we as a parent, how we are models for our children and how a referee should not have to turn around and police a bunch of adults in the stands who, quite honestly, you already had your shot at playing high school sports. So I'll just leave right. it at that. Um, so that's been problematic. And, and it and it's, it's, seems to be never-ending. And so we can't get, we talked earlier about, about substitute teachers. It's harder and harder to get coaches and officials for youth sports and high school sports. It's not about the paycheck. It's really not. It's about um, the respect that the, for the game, the respect for sportsmanship, and the lessons we are uh, accidentally teaching our young athletes by, sh simply by our behaviors on, outside of the playing field. Um, so... Again, we talked a few minutes ago about partnering with the community and with the, with the guardians and the parents. I think we need to do the same work here. So that conversation um, with Dan was great about our faculty and our students, but then Amy and I and John need to continue that conversation to say, okay, can we do a parent night? Can we do a forum? Can we have kids present at some kind of activity and, and demonstrate hmm. their leadership and understanding of this work? Um, and it does tie to the work we've done this year that I've presented a couple times on around a sense of belonging and really understanding culturally responsiveness within our schools and our communities. Um, so we're just at the beginning of this. I, I've, in almost 30 years, I've been to a lot of trainings. Um, this was one of the most impactful trainings I've been part of in, in many, many years. And uh, I think Amy felt the same way. I know John did. And I know as an athletic director, there's nothing worse than just having to address some of the things that we're addressing across the state right now in, in youth sports specifically. But my fear is it will leak beyond sports. I mean, it'll leak into other aspects of these young people's lives, um, and, and we just have to find a way to, to kind of eradicate that at this point in time. Were, were there um, examples of best practices of where they've been able to, to contain the parents? Because I think that's... <laughs> Yeah. From all I hear from sports parents, that's the biggest challenge for the officials, for, for kids who are often observing good sportsmanlike behavior, but then they get a cue from their parent and suddenly they're you know challenging the officials on a call they would have accepted. Has anyone come close to solving or better handling this problem? Not from an educational standpoint. A lot of the conversations were really about containment. Yeah. And how how do we wow. how do we yeah I know but how do we ensure that the student athletes specifically get a pure experience that's not tainted by the the actions of adults? Yeah. Um, and I we've had peers you've seen it in the news we've probably even seen it just outside our league if not within our league where they've just said forget it we're going to play games in front of nobody and some of the athletic directors said geez you know again things we learned about COVID some of the athletic events um, when we had no spectators in the stands. They were great games. Um, sad it's sad. It's a sad yeah. commentary. But, you know, uh, we shouldn't have to clear a, clear an ice rink. Or we shouldn't have to say nobody's allowed in the gym. We shouldn't have to say get an app to watch your high school senior play, play a sport. Right. Um, and, and so, unfortunately, a lot of it was around containment. Yeah. But this kind of work being done by, at Northeastern and it, it, by different organizations across the country, I think, is going to help us um, – deal with education for students, but eventually just let the adult population know, you know, there's no tolerance for hate, uh, there's no tolerance for microaggression, there's no tolerance for a lack of inclusivity, um, and we'd like to partner with you and for you for the sake of your kids and the next generation, but respectfully, you can't get in the way of that work either. And I, I think it'd be interesting that, you know, letting the kids lead, mm -hmm. I think, is like, we're not being successful in what's happening now, mm -hmm. so letting the kids lead, and I saw like, a tiny glimpse of just the littlest part of that. I don't know if everyone else saw the video that, was it on Instagram or was it PSA, on? PSA, yeah. Yeah, the PSA. Yeah. Talk, and the, it was the kids, the athletes, talking about, like, this is our season. Like, let us right. play. Let us, this is for us. Um, basically, adults, knock it off uh, in a nicer way. And I thought that was, like, just a tiny glimpse of, you know, if the adults 
are having a hard time getting it together and containing themselves. It's the, you know, reaching the kids and having them sort of be the leaders in this is, you know, potentially the way to go. And at the same time, trying to bring the adults in. Mm -hmm. But I think when the kids really get a good dose of this and start really strongly advocating, hopefully the adults follow. And I do want to be careful because it's a public meeting. I mean, like any other concern we have, it's a minority. Yeah. It's always yeah. a small minority of human beings that force us to react this way. You know, so the, the, the greater majority of student athletes and students in general are not manifesting in a hateful, biased, negative way. The majority of adults are not. It might feel like that's not true all the time when we turn on the TV and we watch the news. Um, but generally speaking, that's not my experience. Um, but things grow and, and, and develop. And so if we don't have programs and partnerships like this, um, you know, it could get worse. And so we're excited for this. It's a good organization. Um, I don't know how many, I'll ask him next time on the call, I don't know how many school districts have really reached out to him directly to say, you know, come in and work in the schools. I'm going to encourage my peers to do so after this experience and just say, listen, if five, six, ten of us locally can really do this work, then at least we can impact our league, our region, in a positive way. That's great. When you say there's a regional component to it, regional training? Yes. Um, is that with other schools in our league? Yes, yeah. So, so I basically. Athletic director, yeah. the superintendent. Yes, so. we basically went to the one at Endicott College because that's where everybody from North Shore went. Yeah, there were a couple, there were some people from Merrimack Valley that had also come up. Um, but yeah, if you, um, in the bigger PR materials, I think there were six clusters across the Commonwealth um, that we could choose. Yeah, it didn't list which districts were participating, but, right. but it's the ones that are in our league. Yeah, and um, it's about as close to being voluntold for something as possible. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, it was everybody will go, sign in, you know, you'll get the email to follow up. Um, and so I mean that in a little bit of a jest, but I'm, yeah. the end result was unbelievably powerful. So. Sounds I, um, it's kind of interesting when we hear about the discussions tonight. We've talked about um, arts, the music, drama, talked about public health, talked about the hate in sports. And we're not talking about the students learning in a classroom and the curriculum, <clears throat> but we're at a school committee meeting. <clears throat> and I find that very, very interesting. Um, so we think about what schools are being asked to do now is so much more than what most people realize. And thinking about your communication plan and the strategic planning for next year, it just, this is such a big part of it, I think. And um, yeah, I agree. yeah, all of it is just, it has to, somehow it has to be a way to, to get it out there to everybody um, and bring it together. Maybe we could uh, do this at town meeting too, just saying. Because <laughs> it was so short. Right. We have There's time. plenty of time to do it there. Polite. Plenty of time. Well, thank you. That sounds really yep. both important and you've got the right yep. sort of participants involved yep. from the Northeastern through the And as always, I'll give you updates as the work goes on, let you know how things are going. Great. Oh, yes. Question from the audience. Yay. <laughs> comment um, to make just to um, in the sense of I've you know Michael's been playing sports and the FRA has been doing these um, I forget what they're called but they were um, a sportsmanship programs for parents and you know that sort of sounds like something that you want to do and just to let you know that like nobody comes or the people or, or it's uh, you're singing to the choir um, situation and I just wanted to note like you know John's is like everybody has to fill out the concussion form every year it would be great if the, if these people could provide you with some sort of even if it was online you have to have training about what you can and cannot say what is a microaggression people don't you know and it would be great if the parents had to when they sign their kids up to the sport you can't you can't submit your money until you watch some video about you know about these things so that's my only comment it was one of the conversations at the first workshop that, I, that we attended was um, what's the prerequisite, so to speak, for your children to participate in what we offer? 
um, whether whether it's a video that people say they watch and don't watch or whether we actually make them show up um, and sign in for an hour session with somebody um, be interesting but it, it, it you know we get knocked on a lot of times in public schools for not um, partnering up a lot of times and offering those things but unfortunately the experience is similar that we can hold a night like that and we get small numbers or you small numbers and preach into the choir so I, I think um, we'll settle in on on this work in October watch how that unfolds with the faculty and the students and then probably sit down with the leadership team and say okay what's our next step with the community all right so next item thank you mark that's yep. great yep. next item elementary school literacy update <laughs> so excited to talk about this one um, uh -oh. So here, so you just wanted to talk about academics, <laughs> and you want to talk about teaching and learning, and I'm itching to talk about teaching and learning. So um, some of this is uh, repetitive updates um, because we, we've already talked about some of the grant work that's happened, but then we were in a placeholder waiting for another grant, and then we were in a placeholder for me to give you an update on our literacy curriculum. Um, so all of that is very, very close to finalized. So I'm going to give you... Um, hopefully a pretty solid update here. So as you know, we originally were approved in October of 22 for a DESE Lead for Literacy grant. That has allowed us to develop a literacy action plan that aligns to our MTSS work at the elementary school. A really, really important connection, and that was missing. So we know through our standardized testing, we know through our in-house work, we know that we were struggling with um, reading and writing skills at a younger age level. Uh, so that allowed us to qualify for this, allowed us to get some guidance from DESE um, and from leadforliteracy.org who partnered with DESE. So Jody Goodyou, Amy Waterman, Bridget O'Connell, Michelle Nade, and Bridget Sheehan um, worked on this committee to really help develop a literacy action plan. Um, they present the plan to DESE uh, in April. Desi sends it back with some tweaks and updates, and then we get final completion by June 23rd. And that plan um, gets us in the, I won't say in the good graces, it gets us in the good graces of the department and puts us on this list of schools that has done the work that they're looking, the prep work, so to speak, that they're looking to set the foundation for our literacy work. Um, that then led to a staff survey. This was part of it where they identified the top two literacy needs. Um, that led to us doing some professional development around the science of reading. And I think I mentioned this at one of our last meetings that we had a consultant, Brent Conway, come in who does a lot of work nationally in this area, um, happens to also be a local assistant superintendent. So we were uh, um, easier, easier to get us on his calendar than someone else. Um, and we partnered with him for one big PD day around the research and evidence of evidence-based reading. That was a fantastic partnership. He did a full day, a full half day, sorry, with the elementary school, and we brought the middle school English teachers and special ed teachers as well, because we started to have a conversation that whatever literacy work we do at the elementary school, it does spiral up, and we needed to make sure our ELA department and our special ed teachers at the middle school knew um, what we conceptually were believing in, what we were, what our foundational um, understandings were around the science of reading, and that we all kind of had a similar foundational base. Um, one of our previous meetings, I told you that we had applied for the Accelerating Literacy Learning Through High Quality Instructional Materials Grant. That's a mouthful. Um, we just got approval for this grant. Um, this was another competitive grant. Um, this will fund 50% of a three-year digital subscription um, for core curriculum programming. So all the materials, ha there's some caveats, all the materials have to be ordered by a certain date. We have to expend all the funds before the end of June, um, and we have to do some initial professional development around this. In a small district where the budget is tight and where we don't really have a, a thick, robust curriculum um, review and adoption cycle from a funding standpoint, this is a huge win for us a huge win for us to get 50% of this funded from the state. Um, then we have conversations around our ESSER money, and we also have conversations, if you remember, when we worked the budget, we pulled certain monies out of the three, the three school budgets, put them into central office so that I could have some kind of modest curriculum line uh, going forward for pre-K to 12 curriculum review. So the, those monies aligned with whatever ESSER money still could exist along with this 50% funding. Um, is going to put us really, really in a good position um, to move forward with brand new programming for students right out of the gate next year. So the work that's happened 
literally ending with today, if, as you can see, the, the last thing on this slide is that um, we had a lead for literacy team. They reviewed, they reviewed Curate, which is a Massachusetts DESE um, ranking system, so to speak, where they've provided overviews for all the major curriculum materials and resources from all the major publishers, and they've they've um, ranked them for alignment to the from uh, to the Massachusetts frameworks. They've ranked them in alignment with best practices around the science of reading, and they've ranked them around usability um, and accessibility. So Curate has done that at the state level. Ed Reports is a national organization that has also done this. So the way we worked this with the grant is that our curriculum review team came together and we needed to make sure whatever programs we were reviewing were at the highest level, not just at the state level for Curate, but at the national level for Ed Reports. And those were our cut lines. Um, we then met virtually, not me, but the team met virtually with the publishers of the top five programs. So that was our, our cut point. We found top five top programs through these two mechanisms. Um, they reviewed the top two staff choices, came out of this review team. They met with the publishers to get, do a Q&A session. All RES teaching staff, so all of our faculty who will teach ELA, um, reading and writing at the elementary school, were part of this process at the next level. They utilized the Institute for Education Science rubric on reading and language arts, um, and they reviewed all five of these programs on that rubric, um, and they did that during curriculum, PLC, and prep times through a nice uh, leadership model there. And then our smaller curriculum review team, which was the first group of people that we talked about, plus if you look at this list on the second to last bullet, this was the review team plus one rep from every grade level. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure there was just a, some systemic um, representation across the board there. Um, and they actually met today um, and came with their top two choices. And then uh, Principal Waterman, Assistant Principal Good, you and I will have a meeting Monday if my calendar uh, looks good enough. Um, we will meet on Monday. They will give me a full review of this process that I'm highlighting for you tonight. Um, and then we're going to be talking to vendors um, and making a final decision on which program. So the way it works is that the teams came to consensus on two and they know that we'll be the final decision makers and they have to be okay with either of those being chosen. Um, and that's that's where we stand today. So that literally ended today. They um, and I before, just found out what the I can't tell you <laughs> publicly yet, but I just found out what the top two were just before I came to the right. meeting. So super excited. Um, I can't tell you how much work has gone into this. Um, I have done the least amount of work. Um, your two leaders at the elementary school have led an, in an unbelievably inclusive manner. Um, and then all of the people that we've named on the slide deck tonight have spent lots of personal time, professional time, trying to get this right. You get one shot at this. Yeah. Um, one shot at the grant money, one shot to write the ship at the elementary level, one shot. Every kid, I've been saying this as much as I can say in-house, every kid only gets one shot at first grade, one shot at second grade, one shot at third grade. We can't wait two or three more years. I've never been a big fan of piloting because every time you pilot, um, there's dissension in the ranks sometimes because you're piloting different programs, and then you've spent another year, and you might not wind up with that one anyway. So this was a really nice process. It was super accelerated. Um, my experience is I've always done this in a you know, 10-month to 18-month period. So uh, again, they did 10 to 18 months worth of work fast, but they did it really, really well, and our students are going to be all the better for it. Um, so thank you to everybody involved. Excited to talk about it. Um, and really excited to see it in action. You know, we'll have vendors in soon. We'll make decisions. We'll have professional development that has to be done before the end of the school year. Then we're going to do some train the trainers again over the summer so that our teachers can work with their colleagues to make sure we're ready in September. Great. So I was actually just going to ask you about that because that's by June that the professional yeah. development needs to take place too, right? The first, okay. anything the Sorry. Anything the grant covers has to right. be done by right. June. Right. So I'll I'll carefully manage the grant expenditure yeah. with June's help to make sure that we spend the money the right way and, and in a timely manner. So the um, any other PD that we offer, you know, we'll still cut a deal contractually with the vendor um, around usage on the on the, on the program, um, and then I'm still I think I mentioned this before in a previous meeting, but I haven't um, executed a full contract yet. We're still going to negotiate with Keys to Literacy, which is Jones Adidas organization. Um, and Brent has done a lot of work with and for them. So we're going to partner. The hope is to partner with Keys to Literacy. Keys to Literacy will do the instructional practices work and the philosophical alignment around what we know about the science of reading. The vendor 
will provide PD on the nuts and bolts of using the product, two separate types of PD. So the PD through the publisher is not included. That that fifty percent is the purely the online subscription, and then the PD is being funded a hundred percent. The that it, it's going. I think it's going to depend how I negotiate the contract. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the either either way there'll be pretty robust um, kickoff PD. And then they'll be trained the trainer PD, and then on top of it, we'll partner with Keys yeah. moving forward. That, that'll hopefully be all year long. Yeah. All by next year? All during next year, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's great. Really breaking news. Yeah, really exciting news. Yeah. Good. Looking yeah. forward to the updates. So I think maybe Jesse is in the room. Is that. So we can say. It's all right. That's your. <laughs> sure. So thank you very much for uh, the opportunity initially and then for putting up with my not being able to tell the difference between 7 and 8 o'clock. I thought I was doing well because I was here 10 minutes early, but um, in fact not. So I wanted to come and introduce myself. I am Jesse Palm. I'm the regional social worker with the Eastern Essex Regional Public Health Coalition, which I understand too. I had some people in the room that kind of stood up for me and told a little bit about what it is I do, so I won't go over too much of that, but kind of more talk to you and see, my goal is to see how I can help collaborate and work with the schools and bring resources that you don't already have in and work with what you have to expand on it. Um, in my role, I'm not here to take over anything that anyone does. Um, I, As a social worker, I'm working with all areas of the towns that I serve, so that's everything from senior centers, the health departments, to police. Um, so really doing a little bit of everything. And what I've been doing with, actually if you want to flip to the, the next slide, this is kind of a little bit about what I've been doing. Um, I started back kind of at the beginning of the school year, um, or actually at the beginning of the school year in this role, and working within different already established organizations to kind of help network and connect people to one another. Uh, in Hamilton, I started a Hamilton One um, Providers meeting, which really gave the opportunity for different people that may kind of have known that other agencies existed, but really connect them, um, like the food pantry with the school and the police in different ways that they may not have worked together. Um, I'm also working Hamilton and Wenham don't participate in a co-response program for police like Rockport does where you work with Leahy and you have a clinician. So I've been helping them with that. Um, I've been working closely with the school resource officer in Hamilton Wenham in that district as well as the counselors there. I attend their monthly uh, clinical meeting that they talk about students that they may be having a hard time connecting with resources or just looking for some other additional input. And within Rockport, I have um, been meeting with the counselors, maybe met with them three or four times. I started this year. I actually got connected with them when I was there helping with a, um, a flu clinic that was offered in the school back in the fall. And I met one of them. And really listening to and better understanding what the community is like here, what some resources may be helpful to bring into the community. Um, but I'm really interested in hearing from the school or collaborating with you on what would be helpful. So I don't know if you have any specific questions for me or anything. So these are some other examples of um, services that my larger picture has provided. Like we do, we're involved in the clinics here. There's a visiting mothers program that the public health nurse is starting. That's going to be starting up in May. Uh, which that's they're visiting all new mothers to do a wellness check and assessment and offer resources. Um, I do social work interventions yesterday with the Essex uh, Public Health Department, Police Department. I went on a, um, a an evaluation, a public health evaluation of the house to see, not an evaluation, so I mean, a, um, like they were checking for code violations and stuff like that and there was concern there may be older adults or children there so I did that too. But, so. 
Jesse. <laughs> I'm Nicole Altier. I'm the one that's kind of been on some of the emails. Oh, yes. I'm a social worker. Um, so I think we were just sort of curious um, about, is it um, resources for, like, families could there be trainings are there is it just sort of anything that, I mean I think the best people to sort of speak to the needs in the schools are probably the exact people you've been talking to mm-hmm. right? it's like the count the school counselors yeah. um, and other people within the schools rather than necessarily the school committee um, but I think maybe are there some examples of things that you've done in other school districts or other ways that they've used resources that we could kind of learn from um, there hasn't been too much that's specifically rolled out as far as programs where it's been one school year. Um, something that Rockport has identified or the counselors have identified is, um, well, a couple things. Wanting more training for themselves and setting up a, some sort of program for smoking cessation within the schools to kind of help address the vaping issues. Um, they had asked if I was familiar with any curriculum that could be brought in or shared, and I've been doing some research, and there are a couple different programs that I think could be helpful. Um, they're also interested in more training. There's a, um, a youth at risk um, training a, um, that's coming up in May that's an all-day training that they were interested in participating in. Um, at one point, they were talking about vape devices, detectors in the bathrooms, if that would be helpful. Um, There is funding. We're still kind of working out the process, but the opioid funds would be most likely able to be used for a lot of these prevention um, treatment, prevention or treatment of drug-related issues. Thank you. And I guess I have one other question. Sorry to... Um, do you ever have resources to help with access to mental health services? I know that's been talking to the school counselors, um, particularly the elementary school counselor, mm-hmm. say, and just that kids don't have the ability to access providers because of all the shortages. And I know that's like a nationwide problem, yeah. it's a statewide I problem. don't but have the magic wand. Right. I, I wish Are there I any did. sort of resources or like navigators um, that maybe we could hook families up with. I don't know if there's... There are resources in the area, uh, like Gloucester has the Navigator Children's Fund has it, that they're hoping to connect people. But unfortunately, like setting up these programs, then you're connecting people to who? You know, there's not necessarily anyone on the other end. Um, I was speaking with... Leahy has a program... um, a student assistance program that puts counselors in the school, but that's mostly for middle school and high school. And they have um, Team 14, which is a substance treatment program. And I was talking to the director of that, and if there was interest, it would be something that they would be open to collaborating with and offering something at the school or in Rockport, because I know that's another issue too, is you guys are out here, and if there are counselors, Oftentimes it's challenging to get there, to get transportation there, or you're spending, you know, an hour and a half in the car both ways to get to an appointment. So, but I think if there was a common theme, like it's something I could offer, like doing more social skill groups or skill building groups, I would be able to help with that in a school if that was something that would be helpful. Um, Maybe more than just like a lunch munch, but doing something after school more of like a group thing I wouldn't be able to do independent um, individual counseling unfortunately I don't have the time for that but Mm -hmm. Jesse what is the mechanism for contact with you is that through the Board of Health is it through our own counselors or you can I can share my information with you directly but the Board of Health does have my information and uh, the counselors have my information as well Gotcha. But I'll share. I can leave my cards here. But yeah, I welcome calls or questions. And really, I can design all the programs or bring everything that I think is going to be beneficial. But you know, how do I know what's going to be helpful for your community? Right. So definitely having your input as far as what would be the most needed or a good area to focus on, or what you've tried and hasn't worked, or would like to try and try again. Great, thank you. That was 
helpful and your your friends from the board of health did a wonderful job representing i appreciate that thank thank you guys and again i'm so sorry that i uh was 50 minutes late as opposed to 10 minutes early (laughs) he can give you a hall pass that's the nice part can you just talk to them a little bit about the youth risk behavior survey and sure yeah so i i work closely with um the beverly health department they have their youth prevention network, their regional youth prevention network. And I know they had done a survey last year, I believe, last spring, the youth risk um, behavioral assessment survey. So I'd be interested, too, in learning more about the information. I have a pretty good idea. I'm familiar with Gloucester's um, results that they had. Um, But I know Mary Beth had mentioned that there was a question if there would be funds for more. Was it questions if there would be funds to, to do a more in-depth survey or to provide services or kind of something that came out of the... I think when we were being encouraged to do it, um, the person that had come and talked to us about it had said, if you do the survey, then um, it will make you maybe eligible for some funds to address things like Mm -hmm. vaping, to address, you know, just sort of those different risk factors. Oftentimes what grants need and look for is data. And doing the survey is kind of the first step in that. Then you're saying, you know, we have we surveyed X amount of students and they reported X, Y, and Z. So that's why we're applying for this grant. That's why we feel that we would benefit from this grant. So, so there's definitely so that's where I think we need some help, right? Because so this participating, uh, if I'm hearing this correctly, participating in the youth risk behavior survey doesn't just equal a pathway to funds. It's it's data. Mm-hmm. And usually when you're looking for these grants, like any other grant that we talk about, you know, you need some kind of backing for it. So I do think that would be another place where you could be, you know, we, we're a small school district. We don't have a, a grants manager. We have hardworking people who are, you know, chasing grants that kind of pop up that make sense for them. Yeah. Um, but I do think as, as you are networked, um, if you can help the counseling team and the administrators at the schools understand, okay, you know, whether it's vaping, whether it's risky behaviors, whether it's social emotional needs, wh- whatever we're trying to attack, um, I think you, you could help us figure out, okay, yeah. there's a grant out there for this at the state level, or the federal level, or the local level, um, and then we'll run with the data. Absolutely. And that's really what I see my role as, too, is everyone is in their own position their own, and has their own focus, and everyone has so much going on, so much work to do, and it's hard to, to take time to focus on these other areas, and I really see myself as, I'm here, I have the time to do that, so let me know what it is I can help you with. What, what do you kind of have on the back burner that you're like, hey, we've always wanted to do this, or we think that this may be helpful, and I'm happy to run with those things, yeah. So one of our concerns, but also the opportunity of that youth risk behavioral assessment survey is it's going to identify problems and then the schools are the only, appear to be the only place the solution happens and we were concerned that we don't have those wraparound services in our community if the problem is coming from home, but the problem is seen as the school's problem because they have the Mm -hmm. child who's expressed the risk. Um, But um, I actually don't remember what happens with the survey results? I think we've got two years of survey results, and where are those? And it seems like those results are the things that we should be working with the council. You should be working with the counselors to identify how these services can respond to those to that data, to those data, yeah. as well as maybe looking for grants using those data. Yeah, it is hard to share to learn information. Is that me? Sorry to. You know, because there may not be people that are aware of what the problems are, but they're still happening just because people aren't talk about in, talking about them or aware. So sometimes that first share is a difficult one. Yeah, but we could, we could do it in a way that says, you know, if we're sharing the data, this is what we've learned from the data, and then this is what we're planning on implementing. Yeah. But do we know where the results are of the two years that have been done? Does it go to the Board of Health? No. I know Chelsea, who is the director over at that did the survey for you, would be happy to speak to anyone or share the results with you and kind of walk you through it too. That would be helpful. 
all I can tell you is what my experience has been in other districts. That's why I actually don't know what the pattern's been here. My experience in other districts is it's a little more formal, like somebody comes from the organization and they do a presentation locally. Um, it, it's really carefully presented, right? So there's no identifier. So, so if, you know, uh, I'm not going to blame COVID, but if that hasn't happened in this district for a lot of reasons, then um, maybe we have to you know, reset that. So uh, if, if, for, if for no other reason to give this body um, some, some good information so that we have some good direction to run with. I can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to connect you back to our looper in. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for. Of course. The do you have another here. question? <laughs> I just wanted to follow up on what Colleen was saying, and I think part of what she was saying was it would be great to have someone also to help with mental health services in the wider community, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of it does sort of get focused on the schools when what's needed is actually wraparound support right. for you families. You can offer whatever in school, but at the end of the day, they're going home. Right. Yeah. yeah. So no, the, that conversation that. about mental health in the wider community, mm -hmm. I don't think has traditionally happened a lot in Rockport. Um, and I think it's great if, that that's, you know, with the Board of Health, too, um, that that's kind of being brought to the forefront. It's something that's discussed and resources are being put towards it. It's great. I'd love to do public training, too, and informational nights. We had had one in Hamilton and Wenham on um, harm reduction, like the opioid epidemic and harm reduction and what that means and what we can provide um, partnering with One Stop in Gloucester. I know they're very interested in expanding services out here as well, so I'm, I'm happy to do, you know, whatever's identified, I will run with it. Yeah. So we have some really talented student musicians, and I'm just thinking if we partner that with a concert, people will show up. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about how to get people Yeah, no, being creative, because <laughs> it's hard to get people out. Yeah. This will do it. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. No. All right, so that would bring us to the gift of a PA system from Terry George. You know what, I do want to interrupt. And first, I'd like to thank Mary Beth, because I feel like when we first were bringing these things up at about the youth risk behavior uh, assessment survey, other people on the Board of Health weren't really hearing our concern about the community needing to be responsive and not just the schools. And I feel like you've been connecting those threads, maybe because of the pandemic. For, for whatever reason, you did it, and I appreciate it, so thank you. And Ray, we're going to thank you too. Yeah. <laughs> Newer to the scene. Newer to the scene, but you showed it. I'm running from the sensei. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. So, we just want to publicly thank um, Terry George, who donated a portable PA system. Um, as we continue to try to um, be inclusive, we're noticing when we hold small meetings for teachers, um, we tend to do pockets of PD in various spaces. Um, we need to make sure that we have accessibility, um, not just for students, but for our adult learners as well. And so to have these little portable PA systems and to have a quick opportunity for us to get into a building and, and be mic'd up, so to speak, is important. So we really appreciate that donation. That's really nice. So I think we have to vote to accept yes. the donation. Do I have a motion to accept the PA system presented by Terry George? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That would move us to finance budget Th update. This is another big thank you. This is just our yeah. opportunity publicly <laughs> to just applaud the community. Um, big thank you to the community of Rockport for approving uh, the school budget at town meeting on Saturday. Um, We've said this a few times already, but you know the collaboration between the Board of Selectmen, between the Finance Committee, and then ultimately by the town um, was unbelievably appreciative um, and inclusive, and, and um, our kids are going to be all the better for it. So uh, we look forward to a, a very fruitful year next year um, and appreciate every dime that, we've, that the taxpayers have provided for us. Well, and I think we should, some thanks are also due to you and the administrative staff to June because the budget booklet made it the smoothest presentation we've seen there in a while. We got a few expected comments, but really it went so well. So thank you for bringing that model in and refining it. And I think we've said to the public too, feedback always mm -hmm. encouraged because that's going to be the format going forward mm -hmm. in future years. 
but I think that was really a, a, a unqualified success in terms of modeling and presentation. So thank you all for doing that. June, I don't think there's probably a, a budget no. update per se. <laughs> no, there isn't. It would just I was going to thank everyone in town for their support for the schools and the finance committee and the board of selectmen for their support. Um, it was the smoothest budgetary town meeting section I think I've ever encountered. So you haven't spent all the money in the last four days. That's no, well, saying. you don't get it till July 1st. <laughs> okay. <Fair point. laughs> we'll, we'll talk to you on July 2nd. Yes. See how you're doing. I'll watch on TV. <laughs> so school committee discussion. This is our moment for walk-on items. I don't know if anybody has any. We're looking down the barrel of graduation. That's coming right up at us. Don't rush it. Don't rush it. <laughs> All right, so we do have um, a need for executive session tonight for the purpose of contract negotiation. So that means, unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to our audience. Number. <laughs> Number. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.